Uh, okay, I'll go ahead and broadcast this and some people are here already. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, let's see here. So um, I was planning on kind of talking about a few things of our previous problem set that I just returned back to people. Um, and then we'll see if there's any questions on problem set nine and kind of go over the um, materials on digital logic and stuff like that. So uh, da, da, da. let's see here, let me check something real quick. Uh, Okay. All right. Um, yep. Yeah, so let me go ahead and get started. Um, so I had a few things that, that I maybe wanted to mention about the problem set that we just got back. Um, so this might seem nitpicky to some students, but um, so for the first one, uh, some people weren't giving me, you know, so, so we, we explicitly asked for sign magnitude and two's complement for both of these, okay? So, and it's not so much, I think that, you know, people didn't see that or didn't understand. Um, um, I, you know, I, I think that this is a little bit more significant, you know, so um, the, um, the, the basic issue here being that, you know, that, that, that people should understand that, that there's many different ways we could possibly use to represent numbers in a uh, computer system. So, um, you know, so we talk about the sign magnitude and the two's complement, you know, and there, there's other kinds of schemes you could come up with, right? So, um, so, so for the, the, you know, the, the, the main one, like for the second one, not giving me the, the sign magnitude. Um, also, you know, there, there's kind of some evidence that, um, um, I mean, it looks like everybody understands how to calculate the two's complement, right? So for the um, uh, 29 here, I'll just look at that one because, Basically, the you get the same result for both positive for, for both the sine magnitude and the two's complement for 512, since they're both positive. Okay. So one of the points is, is that for two's complement, two's complement doesn't mean um, you know, so so if you you can't represent 5112 as two's complement by taking this and taking all the complement and adding you take the complement of the bits and adding one, okay, which a lot of people did. So basically, you were giving me the two's complement of this bit pattern, but that's not positive 512. That's negative 512, right? So, you know, so again, I'm saying, you know, the, the, so, so people understand kind of the, the mechanism, but, but they don't really understand what the purpose is of this, right? So, so two's complement is a way to represent uh, negative, you know, signed integers in a computer architecture, hardware, right? So um, if you're using two's complement, there's a particular way that 512 is represented. And 512 is represented like this for two's complement as it is for sine magnitude, right? So in both cases, you would get exactly the same bit pattern for, for the way that we described it here, right? So um, of course these would look different if, if we needed to represent negative 512. So for sine magnitude, we would just, um, set the sign bit to be one, but otherwise everything would be the same. So that would represent negative 512 and sign magnitude um, representation. Uh, but for two's complement, um, so like, like most people did then, uh, I mean, that you got the, the two's complement correct representation for negative 29. Although lots of people gave me negative 29 and then for some reason they took the two's complement of that again, coming back with the, um, you know, the, the original um, bit pattern here. So, so uh, well, you know, positive, so, so if you take the, 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 if you do the procedure to take the two's complement of a number, that, that negates the number effectively, right? So that, that's the other thing to kind of understand about what two's complement is and kind of 
one reason why it's useful for a computer uh, circuit. So if we need to take the negative of a number, um, um, as we discussed a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot more complicated than taking the negative of a number for a sign magnitude where you only have to flip one bit. So to, to negate a number in two's complement, you have to flip all the bits and then also add one. So you not only have um, circuits to, to take the complement of all bits, but you also have to have an adder in there to um, um, add in um, a one to the result before you get the, the negative of the number. All right, I'll move on. So, um, but um, so this is what I got. I believe that's right. So, so I mean, you know, twenty nine is is that with a zero on front. So for for sine magnitude, you put a one there to negate it. For two's complement, you take the the complement of all the bits. So you basically get all this except for a zero there and add one, right? But I probably don't have to go over. I mean, it looked like everybody understood the mechanics of you know if I say take the two's complement of a bit pattern, everybody kind of was able to do that, right? And also vice versa. If, if I tell you, if I told people that a number was represented using two's complement, most people got this correct. Although um, there's a few um, calculation mistakes, missing a bit or something. So, but um, but yeah, I'll go right past that one. So, um, I did one had one thing to mention. So I got I don't know about forty or fifty percent of the students um, were obviously using some alternative of the Booth algorithm, right? So it didn't exactly match the same procedure, the same definitions from our textbook. <coughs> I mean, I believe it was equivalent, but um, I, 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 you know, I don't know the details of that particular um, algorithm. Um, or a particular um, system, right? So I did ask those people that were use, weren't using our textbooks um, um, algorithm and mechanisms for problem three to email me your source because I would like to double check um, the, the details of the definition of the algorithm. And it looked like most people were using probably the same alternative. I'm, I'm sure there might be more than two kind of different ways of specifying Booth here, but. But it was definitely similar because, um, um, you know, so um, um, I think I'll go quickly through this because, because I ended up giving most of the points to everybody or, or all the points to everybody, right? So um, from our textbook, you know, you should start by uh, initializing A, Q minus one, M, Q, um, and your count like it's shown here. So another, another purpose of, of a question like this, you know, so, so these make good questions for, um, um, for comprehensive exams. Although for a comprehensive exam, I'd probably give you like this flow chart, for example, um, you know, but, but you know, I, I don't think it should be beyond people to be given a, a description like in a flow chart and then to be able to act like a computer to follow the steps that are described by that, you know, if, if you're somewhat familiar with what the task is doing there. So, um, so anyway, if you initialize all those, um, so this is what I was getting, I believe this is correct, you know, so um, our M, uh, our multiple clamp and multiplier are these as six bit numbers. So these were both positive. Um, this is the, the two's complement of 23, because we need that. If we need to subtract, we're actually gonna add A to the, to the two's complement of 23, so it's you know, to negative 23. So we'll just do A plus that whenever we do have to do a subtraction, right? So you initialize A to zero, initialize the Q minus one bit to zero, uh, lay out A and Q in this order because we're gonna be doing shifting here. So uh, like I said, the uh, the alternative I've seen, I think it was everybody was using probably the same alternative, but um, it used like Q in front and then the zero bits in the back um, and um, shifting in a different way, so. Um, so according to our algorithm then from our textbook, uh, you look at these two bits. So, so Q, the, the, our textbook identifies that as the Q zero bit and the Q minus one bit, okay? And so depending on that, um, we've got a, um, um, a selection statement or a condition statement in the um, 
our um, flow chart here, right? So um, if we had, I forgot already, if, if we have uh, one zero, that says we should do this, right? So we, we should subtract um, A minus M, which means we're gonna add uh, A plus the, the two's complement of, of, of what we've got in M here, right? And then that result should go back into A, right? So that's, that's relatively easy for this case because A is zero. So if you take A uh, plus the two's complement, so we're just gonna take uh, the, you know, these bits plus these bits. Um, so we end up with those bits again, uh, get put into A. One, zero, one, zero, zero, one. Okay. And then we shift. Okay. And in, in this case, for our algorithm, we're shifting um, right. So the... Um, uh, and there are a couple of things here that you have to know that maybe aren't completely uh, specified here. So you would have had to read. So for example, you know, when you're shifting from the right, you actually make the copy of the most significant bit. So you're going to be shifting in a different kind of bit depending on what the bit is here. Um, and, and, you know, when, when we shift out the Q minus one, um, that just goes into the bit bucket. So that just falls out of the calculation, right? So in this case, you know, hopefully I got all the shifting right. So you see the one gets shifted over here and then the zero and so on. And um, this one gets shifted over here into the Q register. Um, and then, you know, a one gets shifted in since we had a one as the most significant bit. Okay. So that's the end of the first cycle, right? And we're gonna do this cycle um, six times, right? Because the count depends on the number of bits um, in our multiplier and multiplier multiple clan, multiple can here, right? Um, okay, so at this point, looking back at the end of the first cycle, and, and I'll probably speed up a little bit here, but uh, you know, we've got zero one. So again, you know, this, this is just applying the flow chart, the algorithm, but you know, you acting like a computer here. Um, so we've got zero one, so if we look at our flow chart, so, so we're back here. Uh, so this represents a loop here with our condition. Um, and for zero one, we're going to do uh, an, an add, right? So we should have done an add here using our books version of the booth. So um, that means you're gonna be taking these bits and adding these bits. I'm sorry, we're gonna be taking, yeah, gonna be careful here. We're gonna be taking these bits that are currently in A um, before we do the add and adding these bits and you should get a result of that, right? Um, and if you have any bit that's bigger than six bits, you get that, that just gets thrown away, okay? So that's another thing that's not exactly specified in the flow chart. So you'd have to kind of read that to understand that. Um, so that was our add and then we do our shift. Um, so, um, and since zero is our most significant bit, we shift in a zero to our most significant bit here. So I got that at the end of cycle two. Uh, so at the end of cycle two, we've got one zero. So that means uh, coming back in here again to our condition, uh, we're doing a subtraction again. Um, right, so we'll be taking these bits and adding them to the negative. Um, and we should have gotten that bit pattern put back into A. Uh, if I did that right, um, and then we do our shift. So we got a one in the most significant bit again. So, so we shift in a one here. And now we've got one, one at the end of cycle three. So for the one, one and the one zero, we, we don't do any added subtracting. We, we do um, just the shift, right? Uh, and I, I tried to explain that last time in the class, why, how this algorithm works. So that has to do with... Um, basically what you're detecting is um, a run of zeros or ones in, in, the, in the values that are being multiplied here, right? So um, um, whenever you have those, all you have to do is, is really kind of shift the, 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 the calculation when you're doing the multiplication, right? So think about when you're doing multiplication by longhand. Um, so for each digit, um, um, you know, you have to shift the values over by one to represent that, you know, I'm doing powers of 10 and hundreds and thousands and things like that. So anyway, so it's related to that. Why sometimes you do subtraction addition, sometimes you just do the shift. We always do the shifting because that is always doing kind of the similar thing. 
like you do when you multiply by longhand. Um, so. so anyway, that um, um, so all we have to do is shift on this one. So we should have just taken these bits um, and um, shift them over by one. Right, and we've got a one on the multiplicative bit, so we shift in a one. And we've again got a one one. So for cycle five, I also had it as just a shift. We'll be shifting these all over again uh, by one. Right. And then for our final cycle, we had zero one um, in the um, uh, the q zero q minus one bits here. So we have to do an addition this time. So we should be adding these bits to um, uh, these bits here. Um, and that should be the result here. And again, that uh, uh, probably had bits that were bigger, too big to fit in there. So we threw away any bits that uh, came uh, bigger than our six bits that we had here. And then we do our final shift and that completes our six cycles um, that we should be doing for the, um, the boost algorithm that we had from our textbook. Um, and as I discussed in class last time, it's, it's always a good idea to check, double check, right? So um, we were multiplying 23 times 29. Um, so if you do that by longhand, you get 667. And if, if you convert that out to bits, so that's positive. Um, so you'd actually want to represent that as 12 bits here. So you'd have two more zeros out here. Um, but um, that should be the bit pattern you expect if you have a correct multiplication of 23 and 29 here, right? Um, which is what you should have gotten uh, down here at the end of, of, of all these cycles here. All right, anyway, so um, um, going kind of forward, you know, if I do ask, I mean, you should be using the algorithms um, and the representations that we have from our textbook, okay? Uh, I mean, you know, um, if you need to, go ahead and ask. I mean, if you have another source that you think is easier or better, I'd be happy to, to look at it, uh, but it'd be probably better to vet it beforehand uh, to make certain that I kind of uh, know what you're using um, and whether it would be better or not, you know, to uh, stick with the textbook or not. Um, all right, and, and most people did fine for four and five. I thought these might be a little bit more of a struggle, but um, you know, we talked a little bit about 32-bit floating point format, um, and um, I don't think I'll go into detail on these. Um, you know, so to get these right, you have to know. Um, I, mean, I guess, of course, you have to handle the sign bit correctly. We have to know that these are the exponents and that we're using the biased representation. So, so you can't just take that directly. You have to um, figure out what value that represents um, and subtract 127 from that to get the um, actual exponent uh, that's implied by these bits. And then from these, another thing you have to know is that this is a normalized form. So the, the actual value of this is 1.11. Right, so we've got two to the zero plus two to the minus one plus two to the minus two. Um, so that gives us a negative from the sign bit, 1.75 times um, two to the power of four, putting that all together, should you take minus 20, right? And you should be able to do a similar thing for all the others, right? Um, so as long as you're interpreting the sign bit correctly, interpreting the bias representation, and understand that this is a normalized um, uh, form here for the mantissa, the the um, uh, the mag the bits that represent the magnitude. So. so anyway, unless I made a calculation mistake, I had negative twenty eight, um, and I had positive eight point point eight one two five for the second one, and positive two for the third one. Probably should have had that one first. That was kind of the easiest one, wasn't it? So. Um, all right. So you kind of have to basically do the reverse then for five. Um, uh, 
So that comes down to the, that you have to figure out the bit pattern for the original thing, for the original magnitude that's given. You have to normalize that and get the exponent correct for once you normalize it. And then, um, you know, then you have to correctly encode, uh, throw, you know, you don't keep the, 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 the most significant bit after you normalize, you only keep the bits um, after the decimal part. So th those go into the, um, uh, the mantissa portion here. Um, you, know, you have to get your sign bit right, and then you have to you know, interpret um, your exponent correctly and encode that as a um, uh, biased um, uh, uh, value there. That's what I got for that one. Um, and for the 0.645, which is a positive number, I got that. So I had an exponent of um, minus one. And this was our um, uh, magnitude here. Yeah, so normally when, when we show bits, you know, we normally break them up into patterns of four or eight for readability. So eight's about the maximum. But of course it makes sense here since these these bits for 32 bits represent particular fields that we break them up into the one, the, the sign bit, the eight um, um, exponent bits, and then the remaining magnitude bits here. Um, all right, and then I guess most people were fine, mostly fine on this, although lots of people were making a calculation mistake here. So in fact, I'm kind of um, scratching my head uh, how consistently this was made, wondering if I've made a mistake here somewhere. But, um, um, but you know, to get the relative error, um, you have to take the, um, the actual value, um, so the measured value, um, minus the, um, um, so, so this gives you the absolute error. So, so kind of the absolute value of the difference between the, the real value and your estimate or, or the, the, um, um, you know, the, 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 the representation. So that's how much you're really an error, right? And so, you know, sometimes it's, you, you can't really know what the real value is, but if you can, you can calculate the absolute error. Um, and as I discussed here a little bit, um, the absolute error isn't always that useful because really um, um, the, the, it's, the, if these two numbers are really big numbers, I mean, your absolute error can be really big, but that might not be significant. So, so really the ratio of the error to, you know, the, the, the actual value is more um, is more informative about your error there. So that, that's telling you, um, that ratio is telling you kind of how much percentage, uh, you know, your representation is off or how much um, um, uh, accuracy that you're losing there, right? So relative error is much more useful of a measure, right? Um, so yeah, if I did these correctly, I mean, um, uh, to, uh, B is actually quite a bit um, less relative error than A in this particular case here. Um, and, and this really is, you know, uh, you know so, so this is a ratio. If you convert this to percentages, you have to divide by 100. So that's basically about 0 0.3536, 0 0.03, you know, it's, it's much less than 1%, for example, four one hundredths of a percent. So, um, um, and, um, but, but B's relative error is actually, um, um, one order of magnitude even smaller than that. So it was only um, about almost, um, it was only about uh, uh, 0 0.005, 0 0.0045%. Um, then, but yeah, then most everybody had uh, C correct though. So for C, if you get the absolute um, correct, uh, as, as most people seem to have the A relative correct. So. Um, but yeah, it came up, this is over here though, you know, the, the, the error is much more significant, right? So, so you get a ratio of 0 0.09, which is 9% error, right? So, um, Dr. Herter, did you get my message? Um, no. Yeah. Um, so on the one that you were speaking of, I got the same thing as you and I checked it multiple times. 
Um, the same thing as me. Wh which one? Uh, on B relative. B relative, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty certain that's right. <laughs> so, but uh, but yeah, I don't know why. Um, All right. Yeah, so I mean, there's a reason why, you know, the, the, the relative error for C here uh, becomes much more significant. Um, so when you're, when you're subtracting two things that are really close together, uh, which is what we were doing here. So, so, so the, the, this gets into some of the stuff that I kind of do on research, you know, so like scientific computing and stuff. So, but yeah, subtraction of numbers that are um, 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 uh, very close together can end up causing significant errors to, to um, creep into your calculations, right? Because essentially, you know, when you're subtracting two numbers that are they're really close together, um, the, 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 the real parts that they differ by um, isn't represented in your flow. You don't, you don't have enough digits to represent the, that, that information is missing, right? So it looks like it's zero, but um, you know, there's a lot of information that gets thrown away, right? So you, you can have pretty big errors um, in those cases. Um, all right, so that was all I had for uh, problem set eight. So let me know if anybody has any other questions or comments. Like I was saying, um, so my plan then, you know, so we'll go over um, our digital logic materials here, um, and I'll look at uh, the next problem set, see if I uh, have any comments about that. But um, but yeah, why don't we go and take like a, a quick break here, um, four or five minutes, uh, and then I'll come back and start on that material. So. Okay. Um, I got the recording back on here. I'll go ahead and start. I, I just found out my dock camera isn't working. I don't know if this will be big enough if I do this on the whiteboard behind me, but um, there's a couple of things that um, um, might be useful to work out um, some examples of, but we'll see. So, um, this week, we're into our digital logic chapter here. Um, so, I mean, of course, this is a, a, a big you know, topic. Um, uh, if you were taking a course in digital logic, you know, this would be the materials that you would cover in the first couple of weeks, uh, actually probably longer than that. But of course, you'd go into more depth. Right. Um, I mean, this is uh, if, you know, um, this is the kind of course that I really wish that um, we would be able to have more people in, in, like an undergraduate, even if you're computer science, to at least take one course in digital logic, you know, so it, it's really useful um, to understand what's really happening at the computer if you understand it all the way down to the, uh, the, uh, the logic layer. Uh, the, the gates and the integrated chips and things like that, you know. So, I mean, this course being about computer uh, architecture, I mean, that's really, this is really kind of the beginning of, of the topic of this course, right? So the stuff that we cover in this course uh, kind of comes up from this, you know, so how do you use built basic building blocks uh, like are talked about in this chapter, um, um, that, you know, where you, you can do things like define, define um, um, uh, 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 circuits and, and like adders and flip-flops and things like that. So, so how do those components then, you know, how do you design architectures to, to build general purpose computers from such building blocks, right? So, so anyway, um, um, 
if you get a chance, you know, I highly encourage you, um, if you can sometime, to take a course in digital logic or even um, study it on your own. There's, there's certainly, these are two I recommend, the Coursera course and the uh, MIT has their open uh, courseware, um, uh, has a section on digital art logic from one of their courses. Those are both pretty good ones. Uh, um, so, So let me see here. Um, so I'm thinking about uh, maybe I'll, I'll just go through the the questions one by one, uh, but um, but I might be jumping then from there to um, our textbook materials a bit. So, uh, but yeah, as I go along, if anybody uh, here um, wants to ask a question about any of these in particular, you know, let me know. Um, so, I hope that the first one will be a bit of a warm up, um, but, but maybe we can show an example of this. So, so truth tables are kind of the, the basic building blocks, okay? So, um, um, I mean, we can represent uh, a digital circuit in multiple ways, right? So either as a truth table, um, as a Boolean expression, or as um, like a, a gate, uh, as like a diagram using symbols and things, right? So those, those are the three ways that our textbook kind of talks about here uh, in chapter 12. And they're all equivalent. I mean, you know, so, so some are more, more useful than other, depending on your purpose, uh, but you could represent the kinds of, of circuits uh, down at this level like we're talking about uh, in, in any of those three ways, right? So, um, let's see here. Um, well, the most basic, and, and I'm assuming that, that most of you all are um, gonna be familiar with the, the, the basics of the operations here, right? Because uh, if you've been doing programming and things like that, you've had to use uh, Boolean operators for uh, lots of tasks, um, you know, so combining Boolean expressions by uh, basic ands, ors, and nots, right? So, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a few, I mean, as is talked about later on here, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but um, um, really and or and not, uh, form a complete set for a Boolean algebra. So you really don't need any other operator, right? Um, and, and there's other kind of complete sets. In fact, um, there's complete sets where you only need a single Boolean operator to be able to uh, build any logical circuit. So we'll probably talk about that in a bit here. So, um, So a couple of things about this, I'm, I'm jumping back to my notes now, just trying to remember some things, um, um, some of the most important stuff. Um, so when we're looking at the, so, so I wanna go, you know, talk about the the, the first question, which is just building a, a truth table uh, for some expression, right? But, but just one or two things about, you know, Boolean algebra or Boolean algebraic expressions. So, um, by convention, you know, all Boolean variables are logical. And by convention, we usually use one for true and zero for false. This makes the, the um, representations work out um, nicely, you know, so, so they, they correspond to the normal algebra uh, quite a bit that, that you most people are more familiar with before they come in and look at Boolean algebra, right? Um, if you use one and zero for true and false, so, you know, um, our basic operations are and, or, and not. Um, and we normally use a, a, a multiplication symbol for, for the and operation, uh, a plus symbol to represent or, um, and we use a bar over for a not, which doesn't really have a corresponding. Um, all you can think of that is like the complement um, of, of, of a number or something like that. So the, you can think of that as like the inverse operation. So. 
but here it's simpler for Boolean algebra. So it's just a complement of your bit or of your uh, logical value. Um, so, I mean, these symbols were, were chosen because they worked well. So if you use one and zero, um, our truth table, so let's go back and look at our truth table. So our most basic truth table that um, I think everybody knows, and, you know, again, I don't know if you guys can, will be able to really see this very well or not here, but, um, um, you know, so for and, our basic is, is that we have A and B, uh, and we want to do the and of those. Um, these are all bi these are binary variables, so they can only take on binary values. So since we have two, it's like having two bits. So that means there's four possibilities, right? As we've talked about a lot in this class. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Because the number of possibilities is a relationship of two to the number of bits that we have, two to the power two or four. Right? So, so this is our truth table. So, so the, uh, the and, um, like I was saying, kind of works out like multiplication. So, so if you just multiply these together, zero times zero is zero, zero times one is zero, one times zero is zero, one times one is one, right? Which is why we use kind of and to represent. Um, why, why we use the, the multiplication symbol from regular algebra to represent uh, um, and for the Boolean algebra. Um, although, of course, you know, logically, this means how we say it in English, you know, so if, if it's true that if, if A is true and B is true, then um, A and B um, are true, or, or how's, how's a better way to say that, right? So, um, um, so anyway, so, so that, I mean, that's the way it works, right? Um, and then, you know, so our truth table, so like um, A or B, A plus B is, is the logical or of those, um, and we use the, the plus usually in the Boolean algebra, so you can get the correct results by just adding the two bits, right? So A, A or B, that's one, um, A or B means either A is true or B is true. So if either A is true or B is true, then the, the or of them is true, right? Um, so I guess basically, yeah, maybe for you guys to be able to see that, I would have to um, uh, stop sharing so the so the image was full screen or it was bigger instead of having the screen share. That's probably what I should do. Maybe that's better viewable. So. Um, but um, to go back to the first question here, so that's all we're talking about for um, uh, wanting a truth table, right? So, so it constructs the truth table, but we, we've got a more complex expressions for these things. So. Um, but all, yeah, all, all four of these are just using, well, um, all four of these are using three um, Boolean variables. So that means that there's what? There's, there's eight possibilities, two to the power of three, right? Since there's three, um, three bits or three possible values here, right? So um, I can make a, a, a real quick one. So let's just to do as an example, let's see if I can get a, a marker that's a bit um, stronger, but something similar to question one. Um, so if we had like, um, A and C or um, A and B, I'll just do relatively simple here, right? Oh, can you? A, C, or A, B, right? Um, so, you know, our, our truth table is simply, you know, we have to list all the possible 
combination. So we're going to have eight in this case. So from zero, zero, zero down to one, 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 right? Um, so, you know, an easy way to do this is then to calculate partial products of this. So A and C, and we just go through here and find out what A and C is for all of the eight combinations, right? So we got uh, uh, zero, um, um, so it's going to be zero unless A and C are both one, right? In this case, only for the very last case is A and C1, right? Um, and we can do the same for AB. So AB is only going to be one. Um, oh, I missed one. Yeah. Shout out if anybody watch, watching me sees me make a mistake. So, uh, of course, there should be two possibilities here. So, whatever A and C is one, look at that. And then uh, AB is going to be one only when A and B are both true. Um, otherwise, it should be uh, false for all the rest of these. Then we take the or of that. So we've got our A and C, we've got our A and B. So we can, we can get in our, um, uh, the or of those, I'll, I'll call that uh, expression one and expression two. Right, so we just take the or of those. Uh, any place we've got a one, uh, the or will be one. Um, otherwise, um, we'll have zero there, right? And so that should be our truth table for our whole original expression, right? Hopefully that's pretty simple for, for most people to understand uh, and get that. Um, okay, um, so part two will probably be a little bit more complex for most people. Um, and so if, if you remember back to uh, when you were learning algebra, manipulating algebraic expressions, so, so given sort of uh, the laws of algebra, being able to transform those in various ways. So we're doing the same thing um, uh, here. So of course, this is useful. I mean, um, um, the, the main reason why we might want to represent a circuit as a Boolean expression like this and then be able to manip manipulate it is be because we can apply these kinds of laws to simplify the expression, okay? And since these expressions can be turned directly into digital logic circuits, uh, by simplifying the expression, um, you know, we, we, we make the circuit simpler. Um, so there's going to, therefore, it'll be less costly to build, right? Um, and, you know, the, the, the fact is, is that um, you can apply automated methods, so you can have really complex expressions and have the, uh, a computer simplify them uh, by applying these transformations. Thus, thus, you know, a circuit designer can just uh, uh, do it in a complex way, and then you can run it through uh, these different kinds of um, um, uh, uh, automated methods uh, that will spit out a much simpler circuit design that will still uh, achieve the same um, original, you know, uh, uh, function of your circuit, right? So that that's that's what we're uh, why you know uh, these things are important in digital logic and, and design, digital logic design. Um, So, you know, if you go down to our textbook, um, we can look at um, our identities, um, like, um, again, like you might be familiar with for um, algebra, may or may not have, probably maybe been a while for some people. Um, 
So again, I'll just give maybe a simple one. Say, so, you know, we, we've got, um, um, you, can always, you can always rearrange things, you know, so, so things are commutative like they are in, in regular algebra that you're maybe familiar with. So A and B is equivalent to B and A, so you can always uh, put things around and A or B, you can always commute those. You can distribute in a pretty similar way to that you can distribute uh, uh, addition and multiplication. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, um, uh, another thing, way that Boolean algebra is similar to, um, um, you know, kind of standard algebra uh, is that um, the, the, the and, which we represent by multiplication, has a higher precedence than the or, right? Um, you know, so, so that's how we treat, so we always do multiplications before we do additions and subtractions by the standard order of precedence in Boolean algebra. Same thing in, in regular algebra, the same thing happens in Boolean algebra, right? Between the ands, so the ands has higher precedence than ors, but parentheses have the highest order precedence, right? So anyway, um, um, uh, kind of, you know, this is the same expression that you can do with regular algebra. So A times B plus C or A anded of the product of B or C is equivalent to A um, or B a and B or A and C, right? All these you can prove to yourself, right? So um, um, uh, again, using a truth table like this. So like if we wanted to, uh, I think I'll only do one of these. Uh, So, um, that might be a little bit better. Um, so if we have A and B or C, uh, again, I have to put out the whole thing here. If we do this as a truth table, so we'll put off all of our eight possibilities. Right. Um, so we could do, for example, the B or C first, since that has a higher order precedence. So, so we want, we definitely need to do the or here, B or C. So that's going to be a one any place where uh, uh, B or C is one. Right. Um, and then we want to do the, the and of A and that, right? So A and um, expression one here. So um, that would be um, one any place where A and that is one, right? So, so it's only going to be one down here. Zero everywhere else. Right. So that, that's the expression that we get, right, for uh, the original. I guess I should do that there. So uh, we can compare that. So if we do um, A and B, right? Um, so again, that's going to be just one, or A and B are both one. Um, and should be zero everywhere else. And A and C should be one just where um, both A and C are one. So if we call that expression two and three, the, uh, the or of those expressions, um, That. And, and you know they should be equivalent, right? So, so if you look at the, the truth tables, they should be equivalent. So um, because basically, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proving by doing this all by hand and 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 and, and longhand here that um, going back to um,
going back to our identities here, um, so we just looked at that one, right? But um, um, uh, this shows that, that they do distribute. So, uh, all right, I just did the first one, right? But you can do the same thing to kind of prove yourself the, the second one as well. So A, the A, the and of A, of B or C is equal to A and B or A and C, right? And the A, A or B and C is equal to A or B and A or C. And that's all that's saying. Um, um, and these could be, you know, these are pretty simple, like um, uh, A and true is equal to A, right? So, um, uh, so if A is true, true and true is going to be true. And if A is false, false and true is going to be uh, false, right? So you should, you know, you can, you can commit yourself to those, but um, those are all pretty simple ones. Um, but these are useful, like the and of A and A is always false, right? Um, but that, that's the and of A and not A, it's a little bit hard to see here. Um, but yeah, the, the, the and of A and not A, um, yeah, sorry about that, my my rendering in my textbook here, sometimes you can't really see the, um, the, 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 the not or the negations there. Um, so, and um, uh, we'll come back maybe to De Morgan's law and De Morgan's theorem um, in, a, in a second here. But again, yeah, it's a little hard to see. But um, um, this is the the negation of the whole A and B is equal to the negation of A, not A, or not B. So the not of A and B is equal to the not A or not B. Right? And the not of A or B is equal to not A and not B. Um, anyway, so. Um, Bring it back to our question two here. Um, I'm hoping people can apply um, those expressions, th those um, uh, uh, laws and things like from the table to simplify uh, these expressions. So um, I don't know if I can make a, a simple one just as an example. It'll be, I should have made one of these up beforehand, but um, so. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a, um, instead of trying to make up one and go through it, um, so maybe I'll just give one quick example, kind of give one of these away, right? So for this one, you know, we've got AB um, or AC or AB, right? Um, I mean, you know, you could, we could use the um, uh, commutative law to make that to AB. So now we have AB and then we could also rearrange these. So AB or AB or AC, All right? Um, so, I mean, just applying like, like these two basic principles, I just rearranged these to get AB or AB or um, AC. But uh, 
you know, A, B, um, going back to that, you know, so, so when you have A, B or A, B, right? So that's the same as like saying A or A, right? Because A, B or A, B is, is the same pattern here, right? So A, B or A, B should always work out for one because A or A um, works out the one, right? Again, hopefully everybody can see that. So um, 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 just to show that one, right? So you know, A or A equals one um, should be, you know, so if we have A, um, the A or A, Is that, or that's that's a or uh, not a is that, is that right? Yeah. So uh, so sorry about that. I meant that's that's a or not a. So so what I was saying about the problem might not quite work. Um, but yeah, in this case, the the a or not a. Um, does equal to one, right? So, so if you look at that particular uh, uh, theorem here. Uh, um, but anyway, that, that's, that's the kind of thing um, that you should be looking for. So yeah, instead of, uh, so you don't have AB or not AB, so, so you can't apply that one. But um, um, for example, you can maybe factor out the A's, right? So you could have A uh, and of uh, A plus A plus B, right? All right, um, but uh, but yeah. So I'll, I'll leave that there. We'll, we'll try and work, work some more examples, uh, but uh, but but that's what's going on with, for the second one. Um, and then the third one is specifically about De Morgan's theorem. So um, let me go quickly back to that one. So that, that was another one that's it's discussed in our textbook. Um, but um, again, you know, if, if you wanted to, you, you, you should be able to um, kind of prove that 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 relationship works. To yourself, right? So um, um, that is this one here. Uh, but again, it's kind of hard to see in my um, uh, my my rendering on my textbook here. But um, let, let's just prove that um, um, to ourselves here uh, again using like a truth table, real quickly. So. Um, The first version of that is saying um, that, the, that the knot of A and B is equivalent to um, the, the knot of A or the knot of B. Okay? So in this case, you know, if you think of this as an algebraic manipulation, um, We're, we're kind of um, uh, uh, distributing the knot here, but that uh, ends up changing the operator from and or, right? Um, and um, uh, and again, you can kind of prove that to yourself. Um, it would be a bigger truth table, but um, so if we have A and B, um, not, not too big, so we've only got uh, four possibilities. Um, so we could do the A and B. Right, and then the knot of that is just the knot of this part here. Right, so we get one 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 zero um, for our truth table for the 
original um, input A and B here, right? Um, and then we can do the same thing for the uh, the, the, the equivalence. So, so not A is just going to be the not of A here. One one two zero and not B. This is going to be the not of the B. Right? And then we can do not A, not B. Um, by just taking the or of, of these two here, right? So, so we should get the one, one, we should get the same thing, right? One, 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 zero, right? So, um, so that, that was one of the two forms. So you get a similar thing. Um, uh, Similar property, and again, you can't really see this here, but uh, if you take the not of A or B, you get not A and not B, right? Yeah. But the Morgans is, is a, a pretty useful um, identity here um, to know, but, but uh, these are all, these are both just directly applying that, so. Um, all right, and then four and five uh, are going to take you probably a little bit longer, um, um, but uh, because I actually asked you to develop a truth table, but then actually also um, express these as um, the um, um, uh, these these different forms, uh, Boolean algebraic forms, and then um, uh, simplify the expressions, uh, and then even draw like a circuit diagram, right? Gonna have to do a similar thing for both of these. Um, um, although, yeah, I don't ask. I just, I just ask you to kind of come up with a um, a circuit on the last one. But to come up with the circuit, um, you probably have to, you know, at least develop um, like a, um, a truth table and maybe trying to simplify it a little bit, and then you can have um, a circuit um, for question five here. So. Uh, but uh, but. Uh, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit then about some of these other things. So, um, um, so kind of the, the the last part for both of these, I, I, you know, I'd kind of like you to try your hand at actually giving me a, a circuit uh, using graphical symbols, um, you know, from your truth table or algebraic expression or both uh, that you come up with as is described there. Um, here in our textbook is where it talked about uh, the functionally complete set. So and or and not is functionally complete. Um, but surprisingly, um, you only need uh, like just NAND gates and or just NOR gates are functionally complete, okay? So where a NAND is just the not of the AND, right? Um, so again, I uh, don't know if I'll try and prove that here while we're talking about it, um, but uh, the, the, the textbook, for example, shows that AND and NOT is functionally complete because you can build an OR uh, from the and and not gates, right? And that's what it's showing here, right? So, um, because A or, or B equals um, uh, applying De Morgan's theorem, um, uh, the not of the not of A and B will get you A or B, right? So if you know that, so, so on the right-hand side, we've only got nots and ands. So, but if you need an or, you can use that to build the or from the knots and the ands, right? And then once you have the or, then you have the and or not, and you've got your complete set. Real quickly, I mean, I can I can pretty quickly prove that NAND is is functionally complete because NAND is just the knot of and. Uh, but you can use a NAND gate to implement a knot 
pretty quickly by um, um, by um, uh, setting one of the inputs to uh, was it one, zero or one? So, for example. Um, So we know that, that uh, A and B um, A and B, you know, we've already shown is, is, is that. So uh, the NAND, so, so the not of A and B, uh, shorthand NAND really just means the not of A and B is one, 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 zero, right? So if we have that, um, we can make uh, a NAND gate. I can't remember what the, the, the symbol is for uh, a NAND gate. Uh, let me look at the symbols here. Oh yeah, it's that, okay. So, um, of course, so if you wanna make a knot of something, so, so that the AND symbol is kind of this um, rounded one, um, but if we just take like A and, and NAND it with one, um, what we're going to get, um, so if, if, if A is zero, one, and one, of course, is going to be one, one. And if we do the NAND, of, so the NAND of zero and one um, is one. Um, And the, the NAND of uh, one and one is zero, right? So notice what we've done though there is that um, um, the A was the input and we're, we're just setting the other input to be constant one. So, so if you do that, uh, put it through the NAND gate, it, it functionally makes this into a NOT gate, right? So, so the result coming out is the NOT of A there, right? And then, now already I've shown you that we've got NAND, we've got NOT. So I could use the NOT to turn the NAND back into an AND. Now I've got uh, now I've got AND and NOT. And we already showed you if you have AND and NOT, you can make OR, right? So thus, you know, thus we've we've proven that um, uh, NAND is a functionally complete. Um, a functionally complete set of, of gate or logic elephant, right? Um, so anyway, I mean, this, I, I, I'm maybe, th this, this is kind of important because, um, you know, you, you may or may not know, but real circuits like, you know, like your Intel CPUs, are typically built all with just NAND gates. So, so all the, the actual logic gates down the circuit are pretty much just NANDs, right? And uh, that, that you know, if you're just using one type of gate, um, that won't give you the minimum number of gates. So in some sense, that's not optimal, but it greatly simplifies the manufacturing process. So if everything is just one type of gate, um, um, uh, it makes other kinds of things of the manufacturing process much simpler and that reduces costs um, significantly, right? So, so lots of ingrade circuits are either just all NANDs or all NORs um, uh, down at the circuit design level because those are both functionally complete sets. So. Um, oh, um, yeah, there's a different way to, to actually um, show that you can make a knot out of a NAND, right? So, so instead of putting one in there, you can just put in um, um, A uh, for both of the inputs, and that'll actually give you the knot of it. So. Um,
So uh, yeah, so what I was trying to, so, so back to the questions four and five. Um, so the SOP stands for the sum of products and the, the POS stands, stands for the product of sums, right? Um, and, and again, why these are standards is um, the, the, when, you, when you express something as the sum of products, um, Uh, yeah, it's going to look something like this. So it's it's the sum of the products, right? But in this case, of course, this is a Boolean expression. So it's really the um, the ors of expressions that are anded together, right? Uh, and and so why is this form you know useful? Because you can build circuits uh, that are very regular. You know, so you can directly take a truth table like this. A B C is the inputs, and F is the output. Um, and then, so this will just directly be, so if, if you take that and you have the A and the not of A and B and not of B and C and not of C as inputs, um, um, the, the A and B and C, um, so, so, so F is really just a combination, the or of all of these, right? So, um, so you can calculate A uh, and B and C by just taking A and B and C as, in, as inputs into an AND gate, right? So that, that gives you the output of, 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 um, of A, B, C, right? Um, so, The basic idea is that, um, um, so again, it's kind of hard to see here. So, so the, the output for this example from our textbook uh, is only supposed to be the, you know, the, the, this is the, um, uh, the, the sum of products. So it's, it's, it's true, F is true when, when A, B, and C are true or when um, um, uh, just in three cases. So, so uh, F should be true, oh, so we can see it here. So, so, so F should be true when, um, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't even see it on my own uh, textbook here, but, but yeah, the, 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 um, um, uh, the, the table here um, gives us it correctly. So, so F should be true when A and B is true and C is not true, or when um, A is not true and B and C are true, or when only B is true um, and, and A and C are not true, right? So for example, like, like the first one, so when, um, when, when not A, uh, not C and B, right? So, so that's going to be not A, um, not C and B, right? So, so when you look at, so basically, if you have something in this form or, or, or as a truth table like this, any place where you have a one, uh, you want to create a, an, an AND gate and connect up the, 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 the corresponding ones for that output, right? So, so you want to connect up not A, B, and not C is what we're doing for this first gate here, not A, B, and not C, right? And then we need two other AND gates for these other two, but then the OR of that is gonna give you the full truth table um, out of this um, sum of products form, right? So, so this implements the full truth table that we have there by just identifying the places where the function is one and then ORing those together, right? So that's, that's where the importance of the um, sum of products comes from. Um, you can also do the, the, the product of sums, right? So it looks you know, like you would expect here. Um, so for the product of sums, then you would get a similar kind of regular circuit. But in that case, you, you would use OR gates. So, so all these are ORs. So you would sum up all the places. So you'd find where um, F is true um, and um, uh, in this case, though, uh, er, you have to find the, all the places where F is false because you're going to be anding all these together. So only the places where F is false do you want to output have an OR gate, and then you want to and um, the, the results of that there to get the correct implementation of the truth table using the product of sum. Right? And that's a little bit more complicated to understand than the sum of product, right? So. 
Um, but, uh, but, but they both work kind of basically the same way. Um, all right, and then um, back to the assignment here. So given the, the truth table, um, um, you should be able to, from, from a truth table, you can easily always directly express um, the sum of products or product of some form, right? Um, so again, going back to uh, the example from our textbook, um, if we have this truth table, um, the sum of the, the, you know, the first one, the sum of the products is just, um, um, uh, not a, um, uh, not a and B and not C or not a and B and C or a and B and not C, right? But that's what those three should be if we can, if I can read them uh, better there. Um, and then you can do the product of sums. You have to use the um, uh, you have to use the places where f is false. Um, so you want uh, uh, not a or not b or not c, and not a or not a b or c, um, and so on. Right. So that, that's what SOP and POS. And then you know to, to actually build and draw the circuit diagram. I mean, you could, like I already said, uh, I mean, you could you could directly build um, a circuit um, from that truth table right there or from the SOP or POS form. Uh, but but to simplify things, you, you might first want to <coughs> um, see if there's a simpler uh, expression, right? Because that, that'll make the circuit smaller so you won't have to draw as much. And, and, and yeah, I ask you to, to try and, Simplify this um, and then draw your circuit. Even the simplest form, uh, I'll say on, on number four, even the simplest form, you'll still end up with um, eh, kind of a medium sized circuit to draw. So um, um, kind of be aware of that. But um, um, oh, um, I guess, you know, uh, maybe I should describe kind of what the inputs and outputs are. Hopefully, this is relatively easy to see, right? So, so we've got four inputs um, and we've got seven outputs here driving this um, LED display, right? So, you know, if, 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 so if we have four inputs, that means there's 16, when you're doing the truth table, there, there's gonna be 16 rows on your truth table, right? So when all the inputs are zero, you want the, the LED to light up with this. So that means that when, when all the inputs are zero, you want Z1, uh, two, three, five, six, and seven. So you want all but Z4 to be one for the output, right? So when all zeros are input um, uh, on the truth table, all of these except are one except for Z4 is zero. So you get your zero LED, right? So that ends up being a relatively big truth table. You need to have, what, I already said 16 rows. Um, you've got four inputs and then you've actually got uh, seven outputs, um, but, but you can get the outputs directly from the, the figure here, right? And from that, you can drive the SOP and the, derive the SOP in the POS form. Um, and then, yeah, and then, you know, um, try and simplify it as much as you can. Um, and um, um, then use that to do a graphical representation of your um, simplified circuit, so a circuit diagram. Um, and then five is similar. Uh, five might actually be a little bit uh, smaller. So you actually, you might want to do five first and then come back to four, right? That's kind of a warm up. So for five, um, uh, 
Um, so I really kind of gave you the the the, uh, the the proof table already for five here instead of having you have to kind of work it out. Um, so as you can see, I mean, gray code is an actual code that's used here. Um, so you know, to represent zero, the the, the difference is. So, so you can see the first difference happens here. So represent two normally in binary is zero one zero, right? But two in gray code is represented like this, right? So, so the the um, the um, basically every uh, increment causes only a single bit to change, right? So, so here, when you increment to one to two, you have two bits changing. So, so this bit changes from zero to one, and this bit changes from one to zero. But in the gray code only one bit change and for and for every change increment or decrement only one bit um, is changing on the gray code which can be useful for counter circuits and some other things if i remember right um, um, but but yeah i mean this is really kind of your truth table right so, so if you think of these so you got three inputs you got eight, eight rows and these are your three outputs um, So again, you might want to um, do the same things that we talked about there. You might want to first um, specify this as um, product of sums um, and then try and simplify it. Um, oh, one thing I should have mentioned, um, um, so, so especially for this problem, it might be complex enough that trying to do it algebraically, uh, you might find it hard to simplify these. You actually have to simplify, you have to think of these as all as seven separate outputs, so you, so you'll want to separate. You'll want to try and simplify each one of these separately, right? So so there's there's actually seven instead of one um, simplification that you're doing. Likewise for this, there'd be kind of three instead of one. Um, but uh, uh, for this one where you have four inputs, uh, you might want to try your hand. Uh, I didn't I didn't say that you had to, but but. Uh, um, um, it might be nice to use the um, uh, the the, um, uh, the the Carnal maps, right? So, so it describes a way of simplifying this. So specifically, I mean, Carnal maps are really um, again a way. It's more of of a teaching tool, you know. So once you get beyond um, four uh, inputs. Um, uh, you can't really use Carnal maps. You'd have to use well, you have to use more than two dimensions um, if you have more than four inputs. Um, but but uh, if you use this, uh, this is another way. Instead of doing algebraic manipulations, you can use the described Carnal map to find um, uh, the the simplest or, or simpler uh, expressions um, for a. Um, um, a sum of products expression, for example. Um, okay, and um, Um, let's see. So yeah, I think that could be uh, plenty for most people to uh, uh, tackle the problem from the problem set. If anybody has any questions, let me know. Check here. Um, so, um, 
let me just say one or two more things that aren't really in the um, the problem sets. But but yeah, I, I thought maybe I you know of course you should um, uh, understand the stuff about the uh, combinational circuits and the sequential circuits. Um, let me just talk about those just a little bit, and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, these are just simply um, circuits that have inputs that go out. So there's no, there's no number of circuits where a uh, input or an output is directly. That there's some